All right. So, how did we get from here to here in all of this? I think it's primarily because we kind of all started like this, and we all know how this turned out. If you don't, I'm sorry. <laughs> Today, I'd like to talk to you about a couple different things. First, I'm going to describe some null results that we have with oxytocin administration, and then I'm going to um, talk about measurement issues. Hopefully, it won't get too boring, um, but I think it's important to talk about. Uh, but first, let me just say that my intention here is not to throw a wrench in all of this, because as uh, we've heard from these incredible talks, there's something here. It's very interesting. But we do, as Dan said, we need to take a couple steps back to figure it all out. And you know, we really started kind of charging forward, and now we're in that process of, of figuring it out. But it's worthwhile. So please don't t uh, take anything different away from this talk. I just want to show you some uh, behavioral effects of oxytocin according to some uh, recent meta-analyses. There are many more that had been done in the past. These are just the most recent ones. Um, in healthy samples, looks like we have some findings related to emotion recognition, positive emotion expression, and physiological responses to threat, and then several null findings. And it looks a little bit different in clinical samples, where you see a small positive effect of theory of mind, and then a series of null findings. And that effect uh, in theory of mind is in individuals with schizophrenia and autism spectrum disorders. So why am I showing you this? Because it looks like at the main effect level, there's something going on. It definitely depends on whether or not you're looking at a clinical sample or a healthy sample. But there's also quite a few null effects. And that's important to recognize, to know, you know what, what we know and also what, what we don't. Where is there action and where might there not be? So uh, recently, Adam Teed, a uh, postdoc in my lab, and I um, thought it was really interesting uh, to look at a paper by Lane and colleagues uh, that came out a couple years ago where they re-looked at a whole bunch of studies that they had conducted in their lab, and they reassessed them. They reanalyzed their findings, and what they found was that 92% of their results were null. And it was, you know, they had a lot of pretty strong language in there and, and kind of were like, what is, oh no, <laughs> you know, maybe there's nothing here. Uh, we thought this was really interesting. It was an interesting way that they kind of re-looked at everything that they had done over such a long period of time. Uh, and then we were even more interested, and Dan had a really great paper where he reassessed that reassessment. And he applied equivalence testing to those results and actually showed that 73% of those null results um, weren't sensitive enough to detect the null result. So it doesn't mean that they weren't null findings. It just means that we aren't totally sure. They didn't have the sensitivity or power to detect those. And I should say this is also kind of a talk about how great Dan is. I cite him quite frequently. But another paper that he came out with show, uh, around that same time, which is really great, it demonstrates a Bayesian hypothesis testing approach where you can also kind of relook at results and determine whether or not uh, you have the degree of evidence that the data provide in favor of the null or alternative hypothesis. And we thought this was great. We thought this was a really good opportunity to apply both of these techniques to a series of um, studies that we had conducted several years earlier when I was at UCLA. So I'm going to tell you about some of those. Uh, this is a study that we designed in 2011-2012. So think about the context. Things are a lot different now <laughs> in this field than they, than they were around then. Uh, it was a, a study in healthy participants, and we used 24 international units because everyone else did, right? Now we know better, and we need to know how to get that uh, breath-powered device. But at the time, uh, we didn't know about that. And uh, we had 40 people per group. We also had a vasopressin arm of the study, but today I'll just tell you about the oxytocin results, and I'm happy to talk to you about the vasopressin findings at another time. So there are six randomized tasks. Everyone got all of these tasks, and we had 18 total outcomes. We had a task where we measured uh, empathic concern following an empathy induction, another where we looked at social working memory and also non-social working memory, a uh, task involving deception detection. Uh, we assessed perceptions of trust and threat based on perce uh, perceived interpersonal distance. We also looked at scenario-based bystander intervention. Uh, to the, up until now, I still I haven't seen anything about bystander effect or the bystander uh, helping in oxytocin, and I thought that that might be kind of interesting. And also, we had a writing task where people reflected on recent experiences where they provided support to others or had been in a conflict or an argument with somebody. So here we are. Here are all 18 of our outcomes. 
And you can see, using null hypothesis significance testing, just kind of regular stats as you would normally analyze something, everything is, is null. But we had 40 people per group, and we knew we might not have sensitivity to detect these effects. So we applied these techniques, these two different techniques that were described so, so nicely by Dan in these papers. And what I'm going to do is just show you the most conservative approach we took, which was equivalence testing with the Bonferroni correction. And what we see here is 10 out of 18 of these had enough sensitivity to detect the null finding. So more than 50%. And interestingly, across all different tasks, at least one of our outcomes is represented. I also just want to highlight, in particular, three different tasks assessed empathy in, in slightly different ways. And that's kind of where we had the ro most robust findings in terms of sensitivity for these null findings. So in three different tasks that looked at empathy in very different ways, we're just seeing null, null effects here, null findings. So why is this important? It's important because this is further evidence for limited main effects. I don't want anyone to misinterpret that and think, OK, there are no main effects of oxytocin. There might be. We didn't see them in our, within our you know, 18 outcomes, right, across a, quite a few social tasks, but there are many social tasks. And also, as we've known and have seen over the last several years especially, uh, moderation seems to be very important. Interactions seem to be very important. And this, of course, suggests that doing well-powered studies always is a good idea. But if you're looking at interactions in oxytocin research, it's even more important, right? Because we know you're going to need more people to find those interactions. In addition, there's value in reassessing older work. You know, this is work that, that had been done years ago. And um, a lot of people might have thought, I don't know, there wasn't maybe some stuff doing when we took a first pass at that. And now there are these techniques. I mean, there have been. And, and now we know how to apply them to this type of work. And you can definitely apply them to others. And even if you've run you know, dozens of studies, and one of them has enough sensitivity to detect an effect or, or an all finding, good, publish it because that will mean something, that will help other people out. There's value in publishing null results, and I'm really happy that this recent paper got in, because, yeah, you see null results occasionally, but they're often buried in papers where it's like, you know, the third or fourth aspect of a paper, and you don't even know it exists until you read the paper. But we need more where you see them in the title, and so you know what you're getting into, and you know exactly what's going on before even getting into it more thoroughly. All right, so now I want to shift gears and talk about measurement in oxytocin research. Why? I want to talk about this because um, bioanalytical inaccuracy is a threat to the integri integrity and efficiency of research, as Simon Young and George Anderson said. And this is, this is absolutely true. This is really important. So people often say to me, oh, cool, you're, you do oxytocin? No, no one says it's cool. But the point is, people will sometimes say to me, uh, oh, OK, you study oxytocin. What's the typical level of oxytocin in humans? You know, just like, how much is circulating around in there? And I'll look at them like this for way too long until they get a little like, you know, strange about it. And then I'll say, OK, it depends. And they don't want to hear that, it's, that it depends, because no one ever does. But it really does. Our group and some others think that it's likely between 1 and 10 picograms per milliliter. How could it be that we think this and other, th other people think something else? That's not ideal. It's not ideal. But I'm going to explain some of the reasons why I think that this is and why that is the current reality that we're in. Some common methods to use oxytocin. People have historically and continue to use blood measurements of oxytocin. And more commonly, we're seeing people measure oxytocin in saliva. You can also marry, uh, measure urinary oxytocin. But I think the primary methods have been blood and now uh, saliva. There's RAA, radio immunoassay. There's EIA, enzyme immunoassay, and then also LCMS, liquid chromatography mass spectrometry, which is, of course, the gold standard uh, in measurement. All of these different types of techniques can, can be used with an extraction procedure beforehand. What is an extraction procedure? This is something that removes potentially interfering molecules, reduces sample matrix, matrix effects, and also concentrates and enriches the analyte of interest before analysis. This is something that is going to determine, in so many ways, what your range and level of oxytocin is. If you choose to do this, you're going to end up with much lower levels. And if you choose to not do this, you're going to end up with much higher levels. So this is why it's relevant. So our group a few years ago, our group here actually at the University of Miami, um, put, uh, put out a measurement uh, methods paper where we actually looked at extracted versus unextracted samples. And what we found was that without extraction, plasma measured by EIA was more than 100-fold higher than extracted plasma. So that doesn't seem 
like a good start. But to make matters more complicated, we saw no correlation between levels that were extracted or unextracted using either the EIA technique or the RIA technique. This is a massive problem, and it continues to be. Because for anyone who's ever, anyone in this world of oxytocin who's ever thought, like, wouldn't it be great to write a review or a meta-analysis? Yeah, great idea. It's basically impossible to do that when it comes to this, unless you write two totally separate lines, or you, you look specifically at the moderated effect, because you cannot pool together studies that have extracted with studies that haven't. There's no correlation between the two. So it's like completely different lines of research that are focused on exactly the same things and have the same questions. It's really not ideal. It's a big problem. You can't synthesize this research when we have two, largely two camps kind of doing things in these different ways. To make matters more complicated, oh, I don't see any words. Okay. Well, there were supposed to be words there. Oh, you guys see them and I don't. Okay, interesting. Anyway, more studies by Dan, obviously. Um, no correlation between central levels of oxytocin and plasma levels at baseline. This was a recent meta-analysis. And then also using that uh, breath power device, which, we, which really does seem to be uh, advantageous. No correlation between plasma and salivary oxytocin following intranasal administration, at least in men. Wow, that's complicated. Okay, so yeah, what now? What do we do? Well, I think a lot of what's going on here is basically a discussion about free versus total levels of oxytocin. Our group and several others, Gareth Lang and, 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 and again, several other research groups believe that free oxytocin, bioactive oxytocin, is what's most relevant. If you measure free oxytocin, you're going to be measuring a much lower amount. If you think that total oxytocin is relevant, what is free and bound, then you're going to measure a much higher amount. And so I'm not going to sit here and tell you, you know, we're right, other people are wrong, because, you know, I'm not a biochemist, but I do think that this is something that needs to be resolved and that we all need to talk about this a lot more and, and definitely write a lot more methods papers, because right now we have just people in one camp or another, and you're seeing studies that you think you should be able to kind of compare and, and group together, and, and you can't, because some people are interested in total oxytocin and some people are interested in free oxytocin. Even biochemists, these are recent mass spec papers. These are folks who are not, you know, oxytocin researchers. These are people who just want to figure out cool techniques in mass spec. Oh, oxytocin, no one really knows what's going on with that. Let's try to figure that out, okay. So here's a recent quote from a paper. The free oxytocin concentration can be drastically changed by factors like age, morbidity, compounds, or drugs that displace oxytocin from proteins. And then another group just recently basically responded to them with a different technique and said, Measurement of the level of intact rather than bound oxytocin is desired in most cases because the former might closely reflect the physical and pathological conditions of the body. They're basically saying the exact same thing as why you should or shouldn't do it. Okay, now what, right? All right, so what are we going to do here? What are your choices? Well, one choice is, is that you just don't do this, right? I mean, probably a lot of you are like, why would I ever do this? And yeah, I mean, like, okay, I get that. But that's not going to help us, right? We're going to need to, we're going to, need to do this or else we're never going to figure it out. And we ha we're powering ahead with, you know, intranasal studies and all this stuff and, wow, what's the translational potential? Yeah, we don't even know how much there is and how to measure it. It just seems like kind of a silly thing that we got to work out. Um, so I do think people should do this, even though it is complicated and there are a lot of questions that you have to answer. Like, first, are you going to measure this in blood or saliva? It's hard to collect blood samples. Where I am, we do this work, and people pass out. really ruins my week. It happens fairly often. But, you know, there's, there's a reason why we do that. And salivary measurements often don't correlate very highly or at all with blood measurements. So you could measure in saliva, but you, you're kind of one step removed at this point with that. Do you want to measure free or total oxytocin? And this is also going to be relevant in terms of whether you're going to extract or not. If you don't extract, yeah, you're going to keep that bound oxytocin, but you're also not removing other things that you really should. Then, of course, you have to choose between EIA, which has, uh, inter generally has higher interassay variability, RIA, which typically lacks sensitivity at really low levels. So this is problematic. You need a really, really good antibody. And I've been told there's basically two in the world. We've now procured one. Cool. But like, how does everyone else handle it, right, if there's only two good antibodies for this thing? If you don't have it, you're going to have a really hard time measuring those very low levels of oxytocin that you're going to be finding regularly in human samples following extraction, or LCMS, and LCMS is great, but I tried to figure out how much it would cost to measure hundreds of samples, and each one was going to be hundreds of dollars. And if you have five, six hundred samples, 
I don't know about you, but I can't really work, work that out. So these are, you know, these are questions that you have to answer, but until people start doing these and potentially doing several, you know, measure in saliva and blood, use these two different techniques, measure extracted, unextracted. I mean, this is the only way we're going to figure this out, so I actually think it's really worthwhile. All right, so just to summarize, Controversy can and should make us more careful. This is not about oxytocin. This is about everything, right? But oxytocin was just something that took off. We were all very excited, and we continue to be, and we should be. But now let's be more careful about it. And also, you know, as we started, you know, dance a slide with Tom Insel. Yes, we need to increase rigor regarding sample size and power, and we need to think carefully about measurement. Just like, you know, we shouldn't be just powering ahead with 24 international units, because you know, same thing with measurement. You know, don't just choose a measurement strategy because, you know, that group did it. Figure it out. Learn more about it. And yeah, there may not be a right answer right now, but at least know enough to justify why it is that you made a certain decision. Now, I just want to thank everyone uh, who's been involved with this work, particularly Adam Teed, who's just so instrumental with applying those statistical techniques. And he's got a paper, uh, poster later on and uh, with some imaging findings that I'm sure many of you would be interested in, so you can definitely find him. And then folks who are at UCLA or used to be, and then collaborators here at University of Miami. Thanks a lot. <laughs>